This is an honor and privilege to welcome uh, Ambassador of United Kingdom to Georgia, Ambassador Clayton. Uh, welcome uh, to Rondelli Foundation. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me personally and for our foundation, uh, especially after uh, United Kingdom has left Brexit, um, uh, European Union, and uh, has its own strategy. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, days ago the very, very important, long-awaited, uh, mm -hmm. um, integrated review mm -hmm. of uh, security, defense, development, and mm -hmm. foreign policy. And uh, there are a lot of very, very important and interesting things. Uh, and shifting the mm -hmm. foreign policy priorities, etc., etc. So uh, let's start uh, with the key priorities. Uh, you, uh, I'd like you to outline mm -hmm. the priorities of this integrated review, and I will jump in with questions. Sure. Okay. okay. So first of all, it is um, an absolute pleasure to be here. It's not my first time in the Rondelli uh, Foundation, but certainly the first time here. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I think you're right. I think if we step back, certainly the UK situation has changed. We've now uh, completed the process of our departure from the European Union and uh, are therefore able to define and shape our foreign policy, uh, security and defence policy in a way that we won't perhaps... Global uh, UK and the competitive Global Britain in a Global very competitive Britain, world. Right. So I think the situation has changed for us, but I think what's really important is the global situation is changing. Um, so not only are we in the middle of a COVID pandemic, um, that is an acute and immediate concern, but of course a strategic and chronic challenge is the challenge of climate change. Um, the UK is hosting the COP26 when uh, climate change talks this year, really important moment. But those global sort of transnational challenges sit against the backdrop of a really fluid global situation. Um, we think that, um, first of all, we are in a time of rapid technological change. Uh, everyone talks about the internet. We've all been forced to pick up greater use of the internet during the time of COVID, but that, that rate of change will continue and will grow and we think we need to respond to that. We think there is an era of um, systemic challenge. Um, the whole idea of liberal market democracy is under threat and there are um, there is a systemic challenge to that from the states who would rather promote an authoritarian way of uh, ruling. We think that... You mean China? Uh, not only China, I think there are many, okay. there are sadly uh, quite a few states out there, and that's why in the review we identify a, sort of a systemic challenge here to that democratic um, system, which of course Georgia is a strong supporter of. Uh, that challenge is out there, and therefore we need to adapt. So we have transnational challenges, technological change, systemic change, and inherently more uh, unstable world. And the policy, the, the integrated review, is designed really to shape the UK's response to that. Um, and uh, there is also mentioning of the very acute and imminent threat uh, as Russia represents to United Kingdom. Uh, how is the uh, UK is going to deal with, uh, with the current threat coming from Russia to democratic world, not only to, to Britain? So, um, there are two things. I think, first of all, uh, the review is really clear that the relationship that we have with Russia at the moment is not the relationship we want. There are global challenges where we need to work together uh, and Russia as a P5 member of the Security Council is a key player on that. But there are um, aspects of Russian behaviour, Russian aggression, which are fundamentally totally unacceptable and the UK will consistently stand up to defend our own national security but also the national security of our friends and allies. And of course, Georgia counts amongst um, those. So you can see that in some of the work that we're doing here in Georgia through our support to defence, um, the defence forces, cyber security, disinformation, general support to Georgia's um, government and our um, 
engagement to allow Georgia to continue its process of Euro. Will this will this report mean uh, will be a bad news for um, oligarchs uh, who live in uh, uh, London in, in Britain and uh, not only oligarchs but the people who have gained their wealth in uh, uh, Russia and they are close to Putin. So I don't. So I mean, it's an it's an interesting question. I don't think that that is not solely related to this review. So your original questions about you know where we identify that acute threat from Russia, what does that mean? What it means is while we will work with Russia where we have to as a new, as a responsible global player. Um, where we what are the areas where you can work? Russia. Climate change is absolutely critical. Russia still, uh, Russia is one of the largest emitters, but also has one of the largest um, carbon sinks in the world, through by nature of its uh, forestry. Russia, just like Georgia, actually currently still has emissions, I think, that are um, below right. its 1990 levels, but that's as a result of the collapse of Soviet industry. Um, what we need to do is ensure that uh, just like with Georgia, we need to make sure that Russia um, sets ambitious targets uh, for um, carbon emissions reductions and sticks to that. That is a global challenge which we can't, uh, which we have to work with everyone on, not, uh, and that includes Russia. What I was going to say earlier, you asked about what we are doing. I mean, we are quite clear that we will take uh, robust action to defend UK national um, security. Um, Russia is identified in the report as one of the, so, as a country which has used you know, um, illegal chemical weapons on UK soil, resulting in the death of an entirely innocent British citizen. citizen. That is beyond the pale. Um, we're going back a couple of years now. That was uh, we took a whole series of very robust actions in. Uh, concert with our allies and partners, and we will continue to defend ourselves. But Russia country. continues to to poison the peaceful citizens across the world. I mean, yeah. in its own citizens, citizens in uh, murdering uh, uh, citizen of Germany uh, in Berlin, in the uh, yeah. in the very center of Berlin, uh, or poisoning attempt of poisoning Skripals. Uh, in London in, in Britain, so they keep keep doing despite all the uh, reactions coming yeah. from uh, the uh, Europe, uh, from Euro Atlantic community. Yeah. How to deal with uh, how to deal with Russia, with Putin's Russia? So I think I think the we have to be very clear, all of us. First of all, there is a really important angle about working here with allies and partners. So um, I think presenting a robust and strong international front against those um, hostile acts, Russian aggression, I think is absolutely essential. Um, we do that primarily uh, through our NATO allies, but also working in close contact with all sort of European uh, partners and beyond. Um, alongside that, um, so as part of that, I suppose, when it comes to the integrated review, for example, um, we've just announced an increase in our funding for our defence and security forces, which will take... It's a very um, ambitious in, increase. Uh, so it's a £24 billion pound increase, which will take the total to £188 billion pounds over the next four years. It will be the largest, and will continue to be the largest uh, European contributor to NATO. Um, but here again, you know, we absolutely stand by the request uh, announcements. We support NATO, uh, Georgia's um, membership of NATO uh, in the future, and of course we will continue working here to include, yes. increase Georgia's NATO interoperability. Um, and that is a key part of what do we you, part of what Do we you increase the uh, nuclear stockpile because of threat, increasing threat from so the review is quite clear on that. So we will go up from, I think it's, uh, we have said we would limit to 180 warheads 
we are prepared to go up to 260 warheads. That is a, as a result of um, technical, technical and also doctrinal changes made by others. Mm -hmm. and that means, in part, Russia. There are, um, you know, you just need to read the press. They are investing in all sorts of new missile defence, hypersonic vehicles, etc. Uh, the UK has always said we will retain a minimum credible deterrent. And as a result of those changes, what we need to do to maintain, uh, to keep that deterrent credible means sadly we have to increase the numbers. But we are still, we will still have, uh, despite the criticism out there, we will still have by, uh, by some way the lowest number of uh, nuclear warheads of any of the five nuclear powers. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the systemic challenge and yeah. I uh, reacted with mentioning China. Yeah. Uh, what is China for uh, for Britain? Uh, is it a systemic competitor, um, or uh, it is mentioned as a systemic competitor uh, in the integrated yeah. review? But uh, at the same time, there are uh, critics who are saying that uh, uh, Britain, Great Britain, is not uh, strong enough on uh, uh, violations made by uh, China. Human rights field and uh, the, the Xinjiang Uyghur minorities in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, how do you see in uh, nearest years uh, in the decade China and its Communist Party? So you um, you asked earlier about Russia, and I think the uh, I'll quote the head of our security service said um, Russia at the moment is making the weather. China is changing the climate, and I think that's something that we have to bear in mind. So, um, the other thing I would say is, when my Prime Minister Boris Johnson launched the review in Parliament, he was very clear that, um, that the UK uh, is a relatively small country with limited natural resources. We have made our place in the world because we are an open, global trading nation. Um, China clearly is a significant economic player. So the review is quite clear that we will need, as, a, as an open trading nation, we will need to uh, maintain and grow a healthy trading relationship with China. But just as with uh, uh, Russia that I mentioned before, when we see um, practices which we do not agree with, we will defend uh, our national security our economic prosperity robustly. So you've seen that in the last few years with the decisions that we took to exclude Huawei from elements of our um, 5G cyber system. These are, um, we had severe concerns about Huawei and its links into the Chinese state. We have taken uh, what I guess is quite a hard economic decision, but for national security reasons we are prepared to do that. And that will be uh, the way going How costly was the decision for I can't put a number on it, but it has meant that over the next few years, some of our uh, large private uh, telecoms companies are going to have to change the way they um, they provide 5G services in the UK, change the equipment they use. But you just mentioned, um, you said that you raised around uh, human rights. I think alongside that trading relationship, of course, we will continue to be absolutely robust about um, uh, human rights situation. So, along, so we have, in just in the last few months, we've been very clear taking action and standing up against treatment of Uyghurs in China, and we have um, uh, put pressure on suppliers who appear to be using companies who are, um, who have links, uh, potentially links to uh, forced labor. So we are taking a strong stance on that. And of course, we have made the offer of um, British passports to um, Hong Kong Chinese who, uh, whose rights are being violated through the Chinese behaviour there. So those are quite significant steps. And you joined the sanctions uh, just very recently issued for the Xinjiang officials. Yeah. So the sanctions, I think the sanctions policy is one of those areas where being outside the EU we are able to act um, perhaps quicker than we may have been able to in the past. So, for example, uh, not when it comes to China, but when it comes to um, Myanmar and the current oppression there following the coup, 
uh, the UK was the first European country to put in place sanctions mm -hmm. against the military regime. Uh, just a very quick question about sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a little bit different from the integrated mm -hmm. review, but uh, there is always a, a dilemma on sanctions. Is it working or not? Is it effective, efficient or not in relationship with Russia? Uh, because there are skeptics who are saying that uh, it's not really working and uh, if it sanctions dozens of uh, officials uh, from Russia, from Belarus, it, it really does not affect the policy uh, uh, in my uh, in officials in, in Moscow and, and in other autocratic regimes. What do so you think about sanctions themselves? So I think the sanctions are absolutely critical absolutely critical part of a suite of foreign policy tools. They send a very strong signal, and I think certainly over time they have a cumulative effect. They impose a cost on um, individuals who are associated with decision-making and, and regimes, hostile regimes. So we know that um, officials, senior officials from some of those places you mentioned, you know, there was a time when they could enjoy the benefits of the West, foreign travel and foreign education for their children, you know, the delights of shopping in fancy places, and those things are denied to them. That, that you know, over time, we hope it will make people question the value of supporting the regimes mm -hmm. they do. So, so that is the, one you know, of the. But I don't think it's. I don't think it's fair to. I don't think it's a reasonable assumption to expect immediate results. Mm -hmm. These are cumulative. Over time. Okay. Uh, the, one of the biggest issues in the uh, your review is the shift, uh, if you can call this shift in the foreign policy priorities in geography in in the uh, Pacific region. Um, I am sure it's not going to replace the Euro-Atlantic uh, security and uh, Britain's role in Euro-Atlantic security, but. How strong will be the uh, emphasis uh, towards the India-Pacific uh, region in upcoming years? So, I think the first thing, uh, you absolutely you hit the nail on the head. This, we are absolutely not turning away from Europe and turning our back on that. As I said, the you know, biggest European contributor to NATO, absolutely clear that um, the US uh, remains one of our absolutely strongest partners. So while maintaining that footprint here, um, both within Europe and the wider neighbourhood, which of course includes Georgia, um, it's, we are flexing really in response to um, shifts in global prosperity and the global economy. The, the Indo-Pacific region has been consistently one of the fastest growing regions in the world. As I said, we you know, historically an open trading nation, uh, we um, will invest increasing amounts of attention in that region. Um, behind that, I think, also lies quite um, a, a lot of the rationale for another big area of work in the review, which is about investing in a sort of free, open, um, liberal uh, international order. That is about making sure that the norms and behaviours that we uh, have enjoyed and benefited from for many years continue in the international area. So that would be making sure that um, in new domains like cyber space, um, making sure that the standards there are standards which meet uh, the liberal Western market democratic you know, uh, interests. It's about making sure that they. Um, the international trading um, environment remains free and open. It's about maintaining things like freedom of navigation of the sea. Of the sea. That's where um, some of the investments in the defence come back again. Uh, our uh, The first deployment of the UK's new aircraft carrier will be to the Far East. That's partly about demonstrating later this, freedom year. Of the, later this year, partly about demonstrating freedom of navigation and our commitment to that. And that also, um, again, comes back to Georgia. You know, we uh, regularly both contribute through NATO to activity in the Black Sea area, but also uh, through our own sovereign deployments. So we had um, HMS Dragon visit 
um, Batumi last October. Uh, again, that is all part of our commitment uh, really in Georgia's backyard to maintaining that freedom of navigation. And I very much hope that we'll see other ships visit. Very good that you mentioned Georgia, uh, you mentioned before, when in relationship with the Euro Atlantic integration. Mm -hmm. Georgia's uh, key uh, foreign policy priority, one of uh, uh, key foreign policy priorities, is NATO membership. Uh, I know uh, the supportive position of uh, your country. Uh, we have benefited from the World Summit uh, the most in 2014, and uh, since then we have the SNGB, the uh, substantial package. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the Black Sea region. Uh, Black Sea security is coming, uh, becoming more and more in the central focus of the international community. Um, is uh, uh, Britain going to be more active uh, from the military point uh, supporting Georgia's uh, security in the Black Sea area, um, more exercises, should we expect more visits um, of the uh, uh, Royal Navy from uh, Great Britain? So, uh, well, I certainly hope so. So, um, we already have, so I think there is, a, there is a really strong and solid bedrock of military defence cooperation. We have sort of regular Georgian officers going and attending training courses in the UK. Some of this was hit a bit because of COVID, but I was really pleased even in my short time here, we've had 140 uh, troops um, training uh, in exercise, mm -hmm. uh, agile spirit, I think. Yeah. Um, we had troops uh, training, we've had the ships visit. I think that will all continue. I think the important thing, um, that one of the things that comes out of this review is the fact that um, the global situation is changing. And what, you know, Georgia has absolutely experienced this at first hand. You see not a very basic division between peace and war, but actually um, an environment where uh, the boundaries are blurred and defences are tested and probed. Borderisation is a really good example of that the um, detention, illegal detention of Georgian nationals in um, uh, Alkabar's Gisela setting. Um, so you see that on a daily basis. I think the challenge for us, uh, so the UK is already working with Georgia on some of these areas, I mean, cyber security is a really important one. Disinformation is another one. What I think I'd like to see over the next few years is building on this review and frankly, the, transform the transformation that's going on inside NATO, the challenge will be to make sure that we don't simply retain um, a sort of old fashioned or traditional defense engagement with Georgia, but we, uh, that engagement on defense and security evolves as NATO itself evolves and as the threat evolves. In some areas, Georgia has been, sadly in many respects, but Georgia has been on the front line and actually has been one of the um, uh, sort of early victims of that new style of warfare, um, be it through conflict, proxies, cyber. The challenge would be to harness that experience and bring it in for the common good. And the UK is absolutely committed to working with Georgia. How to, how to make stronger uh, uh, British investments in Georgia? What to do here? Well, um, so I've had all sorts of uh, bright ideas levelled at me on that. I have to say, um, one of the things that comes up consistently with business people is political stability. That won't be a surprise to you. And so the, the standoff that we have at the moment, I, I think is not conducive to attracting more foreign investment into Georgia from anywhere, let alone the UK. So, um, Although my US and EU colleagues have been in the forefront of obviously negotiating and mediating between uh, government and the opposition, I have alongside them been absolutely um, engaging with all sides and encouraging them to continue dialogue uh, and find a compromise that will allow uh, opposition into parliament and the institute, Georgia's institutions to work. So it's a bit of a political answer to a, an economic question, mm -hmm. but honestly, um, 
uh, for as long as political instability continues, I think uh, Georgia will struggle to attract significant foreign investment. And I think the statistics show that. I think there's been a 50 odd percent collapse in foreign investment. Some of that will be down to COVID, but I suspect not all of it. Yeah, I think the, one of the worst uh, uh, statistics in the last 10, 15 years, uh, yeah. since 2000, 2007 and 8, uh, yeah. we have the lowest rate of the. Even in, since the last time you had a parliamentary boycott? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not only because of the boycott, for yeah, sure. But, uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, since the last uh, global financial crisis, yeah. war with Russia, and since then we have the, the lowest foreign direct investments. But uh, last but not least, uh, uh, it is important, you mentioned the disinformation, fighting against the uh, uh, hybrid threats. Um, where is uh, uh, your country um, with the programs? And I, I just wanted also to mention the development, which is also very important in the integrated review. I was really happy to see that uh, uh, the reverse of the budget cut uh, for the international development, how it affects uh, the um, UK-Georgia cooperation receive more new projects coming from your country in assisting Georgia's uh, development? So that's a good question. So first of all, when it comes to disinformation... I managed to put two questions. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> more, I know, that's the same So I think there's two things. When it comes to disinformation, um, we have a, a sort of a strong and growing relationship with Georgia on that. So we work with a range of government or uh, ministries, organisations on that problem, um, beefing up capabilities and allowing people to spot disinformation and tackle it. But equally, we work with civil society organisations and indeed independent journalists who can uh, hopefully um, are in a position to set the record straight. And some really powerful examples of that. Um, you're right, the decision to reduce temporarily um, our uh, development budget was not an easy one. Uh, it's caused a degree of concern in the UK, which is why right at the front of the uh, integrated review, of course, the Prime Minister reiterated that this is a temporary cut uh, and we will return to 0.7 when the fiscal situation allows. That headline size, the numbers are still massive. We are talking a £10 billion budget for overseas development assistance. That puts us at 0.5 puts us well above the OECD average mm -hmm. on um, development spend. So I think fundamentally the UK is in a good situation. Um, what's really important for Georgia and the wider European neighbourhood is actually um, our, it's a bit hard directly to compare, but certainly um, we, the region as a whole has not suffered a significant cut, if at all. In some cases it's increased, others it's been uh, reduced. So actually, despite the headlines, Georgia, as part of the wider European neighbourhood, has done very well. We've, we've been able to you know, maintain our support on um, support to your defence forces, the Ministry of Defence, um, reform, but critically, overall public, public administration reform work should continue and we're actually increasing our investments around the, um, uh, the protracted conflict. So we've just launched a programme with UNDP um, to encourage cross-border mm -hmm. community uh, contact, etc. So in some areas we've actually been able to increase, which of course I'm really, I'm really what are the areas, uh, besides you mentioned, the most Georgia needs uh, reforms and uh, support from the international community? So I think uh, it won't surprise you because it's in the newspapers and it's absolutely all over. I think um, look, there's a lot, lot of work going on and clearly um, the uh, public are extremely concerned, uh, quite rightly, about rates of poverty and unemployment. So I think working to 
bring uh, Georgia's economy uh, back up to strength and up to health in a green and sustainable manner is really important. Um, after the recent events, I think alongside political reform, continued democratic reform, judicial reform has to be absolutely at the top of the agenda. It's clear there is there are real concerns and lack of trust in the independence of the judiciary. And although work has been done, uh, and I recognise that, there is still some way to go. And that's why it is such a central element to the discussions that are happening right now. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you for the very, very interesting talk. And Pleasure. I hope also that you will see we will see you here on other important issues and events.